Nana Bunsen may go back way back in, in terms of uh, the late 60s, um, 70s. Uh, Nana Bunsen to me is, is a warrior who take up the cause of his people and, and, and champion it. And it just didn't start in Britain, it started in Guyana, challenging the British down there over some issues that he faced down there. He was also an athlete and he was very fit, brother. And his height alone, you can't miss him coming, yeah? So he's, to me, the memory of him has been a solid uh, African revolution nationalist. Uh, when I say that, I mean that you have some people who are nationalists. You can be a nationalist from Trinidad, Barbados, or Jamaica, but Nana Bonzi is a revolutionary nationalist. And that nationalist means you look at black nationalism complete as a whole. That's Pan-Africanism. Well, Nana Bonzi has been involved in struggle and fighting for African people, especially in Manchester, around, you know, dismissal and, and so on. And also... He, he was very much involved in um, challenging the union when it was a closed shop. So he actually break the union, you know, and, and give black people a chance to become members of the union. And there was these closed shops that you just couldn't get a job in there unless you're a human member. And that's a way of the, the kind of discrimination that there was practicing against African people. So Nana Bunsen was very instrumental in breaking that, in taking on that campaign. So his, his work around union work and, um, you know, uh, tribe unions and, and representing African people was was awesome because he, he took on a lot of uh, a tasks. So his involvement with the Pan-African Congress movement is uh, he got involved around the, the 70s when he got involved in the movement uh, for, um, you know, bring about uh, the struggle to a, a higher level. In um, that we see ourselves as, you know, as African people, that we are a whole, just one people, not this individualist behavior. So he joined the Pan African uh, movement and he became the chairman of the Manchester chapter, you know, because in Manchester we had branches all over the place of these chapters, you know, in the country, and we still do. And Anna Bunsen was very instrumental in pushing for. A, a constant, um, you know, unification of African people uh, and the Pan-Africanism. So he got involved and he was a very uh, staunch, hard worker in, in the PACM, in, in uh, highlighting issues that we face, helping to organise Africa Liberation Day and so on. So his, his work in, in doing that is, is looking into also Africa. His first trip to Africa was with me, because I'm who do a lot of travel in Africa. So I said to him one day, Nana, you know, if you're a Pan Africanist, we have to go home to the continent to see the homeland and see what the the, the task and the and uh, the struggle is there, the real struggle. So I took him with me when I was invited uh, to Burkina Faso under Thomas Sankara, who got assassinated. We went there and met um, Thomas Sankara. I was part of a conference of, um, to discuss, you know, uh, um, the whole thing about we uniting from the Caribbean to America to Africa, you know, that uh, Thomas Sankara was hosting. So his ex first experience in Africa with me was, was last, because certain things that Nana um, saw in Africa, I think kind of just shocked him, you know, that he would see the kind of openness of the people you know, you know, you, if you grow up in the Caribbean as a child, you see women um, bathing in, in, in the river and nobody takes no notice of them. And you come in, in a society here where people would attack you. And now Africa is, is, is shifting to that. But when we were there in Burkina Faso, and we was in a, in a, a toilet and there was with the men tile and there's women coming and use us. The, the urinal, and it shocked him, you know, he's really shocked. No, I used to it because I go into Africa. I don't see nothing wrong with that. No, the thing is with with Africa deteriorating uh, the way it is because of Western and Arab influence, it is a major problem. And we have in the kind of abuse and so he was uh, against this kind of abuse of women and the abuse of um, the 
a multinational who comes in and abuse our continent in terms of ripping off our raw material. So he campaigned and, 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 and speak out against those issues. So he, he had a chance to, to say what he had to say in Burkina Faso. In fact, the, the capital of Burkina Faso is known as Ouagadougou. It's and it's it's a sweet name, but it's a very important um, a place that he went with me um, and met one of Africa's greatest revolutionary, Thomas Sankara, you know. So, and then he went off to Kemet, which most people would uh, not know the word Kemet. They would, they know the word Egypt, but the original name is Kemet, the land of the black. Yeah. So, so he went to, with his wife. Um, to Kemet, and uh, that was another experience, you know, in the Pan-African world that he he really appreciated. You know, I've, I've not gone to to Egypt, uh, as people call it, but uh, Kemet, I've got. But when it's a thing settled down, I hope to visit that part of our motherland, and we must take back our motherland. And he's always in his talk. He'll say that every inch of Africa belongs to us. Don't be coming and telling us about this is sub-Saharan Africa and that is uh, um, the Arab not. No, the Arabs are, are basically settlers and, 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 and invaders and, and practice Arab racism against African people to this day. Because when you, when you go into Africa and if you go into Africa with a mindset and you already um, reach a level of, of cultural awareness and political awareness, once you go into Africa, it, it reinforces your, um, your political and your commitment to struggle. It makes you more ardent. It makes you see more of the oppression and the, 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 the violence that are unleashed against our people, both by Arab and white. And then they use African people, just like you have these youths in the community you now, the gangs, you know, the gangs are, are used against each other. They do the same thing in Africa. And some of us like to talk about, look how the Africans are killing each other. We're crazy because we was, uh, the slave, the, the, the was enslaved by the European and Arabs who were taken out of um, Africa and taken to the Caribbean. And two islands they take us and break us and put us in, um, in the military was Barbados and Jamaica. So when we talk about you know that, none of us will be able to <coughs> realize that um, going into Africa and when he looks at Africa and then he, knowing that history as well, where we was taken out as prisoners of war and taken back to fight our own brothers. So when people come, keep on talking about these Africans sell each other, you're cursing your own self because you were involved in, in capturing your own people under the British, under the Arabs, under the Belgium. You were trained to do that dirty work. So don't go running him out. And Nana, he spoke out about that when he realized, when he read the book, Empty Sleep, to see these regiments that were from the Caribbean, the, the uh, West Indian regiment, they were called, the African rifle. And they were used to, to break down the city walls in Africa to, because they didn't understand how those walls were built. They could breach them. The, the white boy didn't know how to breach them. So they had to bring the slaves back to breach these uh, 12 foot, sometimes 12 foot uh, high, 12 foot wide. So they have to use them to breach it. So Nana was very clear about that historical, and it made him more stronger. You know, if you go into Africa and then you realize where well, you see what the Arabs do and what the whites are doing, now you got the Chinese and the Indians there. We are in big trouble. So he spoke out about it. He was a very passionate and determined uh, brother who wants to see a, a change. So he, he fought for it. It's a pity that sometimes when somebody, the ancestors give us somebody of this kind of character, we don't respect them, we don't listen to the message. We turn against them and, and start not supporting them, but support our enemy against them. And that's one of the things that sometimes bothers him. And uh, when he, when he he looks and he, he looks uh, that he made the commitment, make the sacrifice, and don't really, um, you know, pay too much attention to his own children. That's some commitment. When you sacrifice your own children for the sake of the race, people should respect that. Things, were not, things like the Saturday schools that they started at the centre there um, in Carmel Row, 
is a way of getting to the younger people. And he, he's passionate and he loves young people. Uh, he, he'd sometimes tell me when he spent time passing through here to pick up books and so, and he'd talk about his own children. If he, he regret that he didn't spend more time with his children, but he says sometimes it's a sacrifice you make to do that. Even with me, I, I, I got six children, and those six children, I, I, um, sometimes they don't see me. If I'm off in Africa or somewhere in America or, some, or the Caribbean, uh, they don't see me. And if I go to some real dangerous place like, you know, Congo and so on, then they're worried and they'll be on, on the phone all the time to me. Yeah, so it's, it had an impact um, with his programs that he was doing for young people. Mm. He was doing, uh, um, you know, like he did a cultural week, you know, he, um, he used to do a one week program to try and raise level of consciousness. And he did stuff around Grenada, during that Grenada struggle. So they had the Caribbean week up there and so on. And he was very active with the other Caribbean um, societies inside the, the center. So he, he, he was a star and trigger who keep the center going and bring that, uh, that kind of consciousness and push to, to change things. I, I missed him because uh, when he used to pass through here and when Barry Shango was here, it was his, his, his brethren that, from America. Um, Barry Shango has passed off a few years after. Um, he was at the funeral doing the, the program around Nana. Um, those two brothers, uh, they were, how they, really, how they relate to me, right? I know they, when they stay with me, they see me as uh, a young person that I must listen to them. And they, would, they will tell me, look, you going to cook the food, Beanie, because you are the, you are the junior below us. We are the elders. You go cook the food. You make sure we get our drinks and we put everything on the table and then we'll talk. <laughs> so we would then get into, after I cook and stuff, that, we'll get into some serious political discussion. I so I find his, his kind of passion for young people were, was um, really good, you know, in, in, in its influence and what he does in the centre, organising activities and summer programmes and so on. You know, so he, he's greatly missed there because, uh, you know, especially in the, the, mo the movement, because he was a key figure and he had a lot of wisdom. The building that you're in here is African Caribbean Self-Help Organization. This is one of the oldest Pan-African organizations in the country. Um, it started in 64. Coming um, 1st of August next year, we will be 50 years old. And uh, not many groups were here able to have that longevity. And we intend to go on forever as an organization. So we've been, I've been involved from an early age. And um, my first experience is that um, when we come out of schools and we're in school, we had to fight these white boys because they used to call you monkey and all that. Yeah. Especially down in 59, you know, man wanted to come pick up your coat and wear your tail monkey. And so you had to deal with the boys, you know. So, my mom is a very staunch um, Garveyite, so she used to say, listen, now you, you go to school, they're going to do this. My brother told me, he said, when you do that, look for the leader and just drop him, you know. So and then she sent me then, after a while, I was mean, able to do martial art training and then send me to get um, uh, Garvey philosophy and opinion. And I, I never looked back since, because I've had that book. Now I've passed that on to my youngest daughter. Because my youngest daughter said uh, she wants the book that I bought uh, way back. So a very cherished book in terms of my political education through my parents. So I've been very active with this group. And then in 1977, we formed the Pan-African Congress Movement. But before that, we had a Pan-African Committee to go to the sixth Pan-African Conference in Dar es Salaam. That was the first time it was held in... in um, in Africa, because um, it was held in Manchester in 1945. So then this was the first time, and the Julius Nyerere and uh, black people from all over the world was there, whether it was from India, Australia, New Zealand, they were all there. And it was a very solid black uh, conference. There's some other conference that's taken place in Africa since, and there's others coming up. There's one coming up next year, 
in South Africa? Well, Marcus Garvey um, had such a tremendous interest because Marcus Garvey gave us the blueprint to our liberation. And, you know, sometimes people listen to Bob Marley's song and then they free your mind from mental slavery. They think it's Bob Marley's name, it's Garvey. It comes from out of Garvey books, you know. Uh, so uh, we've, we've used that uh, program to, to inspire people and to do work. Because Garvey sets out a clear program. He's got training manual. He's got um, he does poetry, and he, he tells you what you should really do as a race to uh, get up in, in in the world as African people. Self reliance, you know, uh, self sufficient, uh, move up into scientific field, <coughs> and so forth, and so on. So he talks about a black economy, a black army, a black navy, and the air force. And he talks about manufacturing. So when you look at Garvey and you look at his history and a man who can organize 11 million people, there are no African on the planet today that organize 11 million black people into revolution uh, black nationalism. Garvey did it. And Garvey had his network right across the world. If there was no Garvey, there wouldn't be no ANC. And look what they then they have actually have betrayed uh, the teaching of Garvey you know, with the so-called rainbow nation. What rainbow? There ain't no na rainbow nation on this planet. That's a kind of crazy, uh, stupid um, mentality, you know. So that's why South Africa is still controlled by whites today. You go down there and you see it. It's plain and simple. So Garvey makes you able to, like, it gives you this thing about uh, travel because Garvey traveled a lot. So he could assess and analyze the condition of African people. And that's what we do when we, we started. And by 68, we had members going to um, India, Russia, uh, America, Caribbean, South America. So it, it then gives you a kind of under, a global overview of the whole African situation, the oppression, the violence, how people can set you against each other. Because if you can set you against each other, as I said earlier, and if you, you take some people out of the continent by force and you train them and send them in back to attack their own people, you, you can see what I mean. And that's why, you know, this famous queen in Africa, Yasantiwa, when she see them coming, she said, I'm killing my brother. She put on her arms and she end up surrendered to the British, end up down, way down the coast into, in the island Seychelles, she, she and... Pampy the king. So when they say African people sell each other, they, they need to study their history. We had 300 years of war to get us out, for us to be sitting in this room. And we have to think about that. 300 years of war just to remove us out of the continent. People think it just happened like that. And, you know, this, this, this false delusion, you see. And that's what Garvey does for us, and Nana Bunsa ourselves, is that you see, when the things like Obama come about, it makes you see through the bigger picture. Obama is not for us. Obama is for them. He's working for them. He's not working in our interests. And that's why we can give a clear political analysis of situation and we can go to Africa. If, when I go to the Congo and speak at conferences, it gives me that level. Like just me and Nana relating and Nana teaching me things and I teach them. So. It, it gave me that uh, understanding where we can actually see things. And I go to the Congo and spend, and I go to a conference in the Congo. I can speak out about what I see. I can speak from the art, and I can speak from what I see. That's the trickery and the, the skullduggery that white people and Arabs are playing on us. You know, so that's that's what it has done for both Nana and Garvey. And he he loved uh, Marcus Garvey because we used to debate with him. And Barish go when they come to us about Garvey, whether Garvey was right in this aspect of the book, uh, that aspect, when it, it talks about up you mighty race, how do we get to be up you as a race? You see, and it, 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 it shows, you know, with the Garvey practices about the, the factories he set up, the businesses he set up, the newspapers, and so on. There's much more to Garvey than people think what them hear. <clears throat> rumors, people just spread rumors about, and this is where we would debate. People would go out and say Garvey was a thief, and it was he, um, you know, people sell him for rice and peace. 
But you have to look at the whole bigger picture. Attempt assassination on Garvey, framed up by the US government, uh, saying he fraud the mail. All those issues of it. They sabotaging of the ships, you know, by white engineers and black people. And our, the, the, the first FBI agents were black, organized by Edgar Hoover to destroy Garvey movement. So it, 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 it teaches you a lot. And that's how we grow politically. So both myself and uh, Nana, you know, used to rap. Even when he came down here and he wanted to go buy books for the uh, shops he was running in the centre, he would stop off here and say, come on, boy, you are, you're driving to London and driving me back. And I think, well, as he's get on in age, he, he needed that assistance. You know, so I would drive him to go to Pepper Kai Book Distribution to get the books and come back up, you know, and then he, he would rest again and he'd move on. Or he might not rest, he'd just go on home. Yeah. <clears throat> now, Kwanzaa um, was started in 66 by Marlon Karanga in the US. <clears throat> and he used to have an organization there in, in uh, California, I think it was. And uh, he, he actually looked into African culture the different um, harvests, you know, that we have and when people celebrate and have festival, like you have in Nigeria with the Igbo, they will practice the Yam Festival in Tanzania and down that, so in East Africa they can't. So we, we would, we would um, got involved in that. And I m tell in, in truth, we, our organization, the, the organization that Elf Farm PACM, Af African Caribbean Self Help, actually was one of the first group to start doing Kwanzaa in this country. When we started doing Kwanzaa, it was uh, it's seven principles and the Nguba Saba. So we have like uh, the Congo, you know, came out, yeah, there's Congo holder there, and it's our seven Congos, you know. And the, the first Congo is black, and then the others are red and green that represent the Garvey the nationalist color. You know, so when we started that, you know, people didn't, first of all, didn't take to it because we can be very hostile about our own culture. We will embrace the white man culture of Christmas and, and not want to embrace your own self. You, want, you don't want to be your sweat self. If you love yourself, you want to be yourself. So the whole thing with Kwanzaa, it gives you all the principles that, you know, from co-op economic, um, self-determining, purpose, faith, uh, you know, and so on, the, the, the whole principles of Kwanzaa. So we start going around, like what's coming up now is that you get the last day of Kwanzaa in this country is, is usually celebrated in Manchester. And it will be there this year because Nana started to make sure that it happened every year there in, in, in Manchester. So because he's a chair of that branch of the PACM, we, we have everywhere the branches, they promote it and they go, go around the country. So Kwanzaa is, is a very cultural, spiritual um, practice where people bring food. You make your own present. You don't go buy nothing from the commercial shop. You make your own present to give to people and you would do it. We, the, we have a feast uh, at the end of Kwanzaa and, and it's simple that it's more culturally um, uh, men dancing for the, for the women and children and the women and, uh, will dance for the men and children. So there's, and it's always done in a circle. There's libation, pouring to the ancestors and respecting the ancestors. And also you, you, you will also ask people to perform poetry, singing, and you would ask everybody to make sure what you want to achieve for next year. So it's a very practical um, program, Kwanzaa, in terms of practicing from the 26th till New Year's, uh, end of New Year's Day, 26th of December to the New Year's, and it's set a principle of seven. So you, that program itself is an ongoing program. It's... Uh, it's done right throughout the U.S., in the Caribbean, and now it's, it's more people in Africa is taking it on. So it's gradually spreading globally, you know. So uh, Nana and ourselves as an organization have been trying to push to get that in our communities. So you, the basic principle of country, you should do it in your home. 
you know, the whole setup. You do it at your home with your own family, uh, you know, and some people will be very uh, pulled back, as I say, because it's too black for them, uh, you know, and sometimes people tell you it's too black because you're being yourself. You're not being somebody else. You're not imitating somebody else. So Kwanzaa is, is that. It's not about imitating another race as so It's about uh, our own culture. And that what Nana um, was instrumental and helped to push that as well. I think that when Nana um, went to Ghana and they, they installed him as a chief, I think it was one of the biggest <laughs> achievements for him and his wife, they went to Ghana and got installed as chief. And it was one of the greatest honor to Dana. He was very proud and he appreciated that more than anything, that going to Africa and get installed as a chief. Because it is like he's full circle now. You take us out and enslave us. And here's the, the, the in prisoner of war going home, back to his homeland and actually becoming a chief. And he is destined for him to do that. It's the will of the ancestors. He, that's part of his destiny. So he, he was very proud of being a chief uh, of the, from Ghana, installed in Ghana. So he was very proud. I would just say, um, maybe then, he, he, as you would say, word can't describe how he feels about being a chief and the honor of being a chief. You know, that's when we sit and we talk about how it is to be in stool. It was really powerful for him. He found that very inspiring, uplifting, and spiritually solid. So he used to, um, when Kwanzaa and stuff like that, as a chief, he used to pour libation and he, how we were meeting away from the RSA ALD and he come to the African Liberation Day. He would pour libation and he was very. His his uh, title of chief gives him that kind of thing to be more spiritual and more connected to the universe. People don't know that we are all connected to everything we see around us, whether it's tree or uh, rock or uh, earth. There's on the universe we are connected. So that kind of understanding was definitely, and that's why he he got married in an African tradition. A lot of people don't understand that. He's, 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 he's actually found out his spiritual bear, you know, and being one with the Creator, which is this awesome universe that we, we are on this planet here. I think Nana Bunsen is uh, one of our uh, per, uh, people that young people should look to, to look at his political, you know, where he's coming from, his background, his struggle, and his fight for his race. And don't waste time, you know, arguing with each other and, and, and killing each other in the streets over maybe a mobile phone or a couple of ounces or a gun jar or something. Be, be like Nana, upstanding uh, citizen of the African race. So I think Nana Bunsen has went to, uh, you know, from humble beginning to great heights in terms of his political education. There was a massive growth in his political education and his understanding about what it means to be an African. Because that's the important, you know, we can say we're African, but what it means to be African and to, to live out the role as an African. And, you know, when you go to his nana home, it's a museum. It's a, when I go in there, it's a museum. You just start looking around the wall. <laughs> Everywhere you see statues and carvings and all things of Africa. So he's, he's reached the height of being aware of who he is. And I'm saying the brother was very awesome in, in his development in consciousness and spirituality and understanding of who he is. You know, as, them, as my friend would say, the man in the mirror, because many of us don't understand that, what Michael Jackson was talking about. Every morning you go to the mirror, you don't see a Chinaman, you don't see an Arab, you don't see any other race, but the one race you see that looking back at you, the man in the mirror is an African, and he can only be an African. That's how we are created. We're the longest people on planet Earth. Nana Bunsen know that, and that kind of information needs to be passed on to young people, that we are the holiest people on planet Earth. We're the, we're the greatest people on the Earth that develop science and technology, but today we're, everybody's making us be bottom of the table, 
not rising, keeping us oppressed, keeping us out the science street. Young, young brothers are killing each other in the street. They need to look at what Nana Bunsen is, is about and, and aspire to be the scientist, the Nana Bunsen, with a political commitment to lift the race out of, of this kind of oppression and poverty and, and so on. We're not supposed to be um, uh, poverty uh, stricken and starving in Africa. As Nana uh, always quote, he says, we are the creator of wealth. We have all the raw material in the world. Yet the biggest contradiction with the poorest people in the world. Yeah? And, and, and just those things that make the young people know that they can be like him, to be doing the work what he did, so he can hold the, the, a mantle up and say, yes, I am a human being, I'm an African, and this is what we want to achieve for the liberation of the mother continent and our people on this planet. I have to laugh because Nana Bonsu, what he said, he said he didn't want his enemy to recognize him. He preferred the African government or Caribbean government recognize him. And he found it, you know, he said, he said to me, he found it an insult. Because the people who enslave his people, uh, kill his people, drag us out the continent by force of arm, now turn around and want to give him an honor. And he found it insulting, and that's why he refused it. He said he will never take it, and he don't want to take it because it it uh, it's insulted for anybody to take honor from any institution, whether it's a queen or the government, to say we recognize you and and so on. And he says so long as they keep us oppressed, and they do not pay reparation. For the damage they do to him. And if they even the pay reparation and say sorry, he still wouldn't take it. Because history, you cannot hide it. You know that these people done this to you. Why now are they trying to come on and please you by saying, here's a medal and I'll make you give your MB and you should be proud to take it from your oppressor. He said he wouldn't do it. And he's, he's, he was staunch um, against it and he, and he, he held, held out. You know, he's, he, 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 and, and people found, found it strange that here's a man who do a lot of community work, who's committed, and then they're going to give him a MB, and he says, totally, nope, I don't want it. He says, when his, his community is more appreciative if his community recognize his work and his value at, uh, uh, of, of, of consciousness and what he's contribute to his own race, that's where he wants it from. From his race, nobody else, because his race must uh, honor him as as for his work, and that's what he he wanted, that his race honor him. You know, we did we did we did um, appreciate his strong nationalist stand and and his love for his people, that he would not compromise his position, and that's what important in life. If you have a principle, stick to it. Don't waver. Some, some of us wave and it got us in a lot of trouble, you know, you know collaborating with, with, with the enemy and it's, it's, that was Nana style. It's, there have been many riots in this country, but uh, Nana is always uh, trying and make sure if there's a riot, he tries to go out there and make sure that the, uh, people don't get hurt, our people, and, and try to show them that, you know, you can riot, but you must have an objective. You must have an awareness of what you're doing and not to get involved in, in, in a riot for the sake of rioting. You must have a plan, you must have a blueprint of what you want to achieve and, and, and the objective of what you're doing while you're rioting. Because, but he didn't see that you shouldn't riot. He see that you have to protest. And if you protest in terms in a riot, it's because of the oppression of the system and the minds of our young people and what they're doing to our young people. And he said that bitterness can only be um, cured by the, the serious we developing in institutions to, to, to steer our young people from this thing and fight for our own cause. Yeah, he recognised from the beginning, any riots, even from the ones in Liverpool way back in the old days, that we, we riot because of the oppression. Uh, that the enemy puts on us, and he, you would explode. He always said that you would explode um, if you get all this oppression on top of you, and it just keep coming, 
and then the police is stopping you and, and searching you and letting you move on and constantly stop search. Somebody might be stopped 10 times and then it boils over every time. Then people then feel then, you know, if the people complain to the police, the police don't do nothing about it. So people then definitely would explode. You know that, they, you know, that people would explode under great pressure. And this system know to apply pressure on African people. They've been doing it a long time, so they know to apply it. And then, they, then he, he, would, uh, he wouldn't um, go out and, and, and start, you know, telling people, like, compromise with the system. He'd say, fight for your rights. So he's very clear about fighting for rights and seeing ourselves more clearly defining the situation in the streets and all that. And he, he tried to talk to um, the members of gangs and so forth, and he tried to make sure that he's, they are aware that there are better things they can do, you know. So it's not so much the gang, it's the ordinary people he would recognize that fed up of the oppression that the system was unleashing on them. And, and he was very clear on what we should do. In our, we must organize ourselves. Because if you organize, you can make demands. If you disorganize, you can't do anything. So the key is, uh, with Nana Bons is organize to liberate yourself. You know, and that's what he was about.